In elementary school, I could not wait to get off the bus and get home. It meant two things, food and TV. As soon as I ran into the house, my mama had a plate of peanut butter and crackers on the snack bar with some Kool-Aid. I'd grab the peanut butter and crackers and the Kool-Aid and I'd run into the dining room. I don't know why we called it a dining room. We didn't have a dining room table, but smack dab in the middle of that room was our TV. I'd lay down on the burgundy and gray linoleum floor and I'd take off my shoes and socks and I'd rub my bare feet on the scratchy volume panel across the front of the TV. <laughs> we only had four channels. And so I would turn the knob till I found him. And there he was. He had already slipped out of his suit coat into his sweater and out of his dress slippers into his sneakers. And for the next 30 minutes, with my Kool-Aid and crackers, I could tune out the rest of the world. He said I was his favorite. He said I was special. I didn't feel special. I was a chubby, pale kid born into a skinny, athletic family <laughs> who were all able to get marvelous tans. All summer long, I sat at the ballpark while my skinny, athletic, tanned siblings excelled on the baseball field. I sat in the shade, humped up with the chapter book, not an athletic bone in my body. My grandmother said I was stout. And then in the next breath, she would say, so why don't you just eat one piece of my yellow cake? I felt fat. I felt ugly. I felt like an oddity. I felt like I didn't fit in, but not for those 30 minutes with Mr. Rogers. He said I was his favorite. He said I was special. My ears heard it, but my heart did not believe it. But there was one thing I excelled at, and that was sneaking food. I knew exactly which kitchen cabinet doors would open and close without making a sound. I knew how to lift the lids on the kettle sitting on the stove eyes in the kitchen and scoop big bites of mashed potatoes out of the pot before dinner and then smooth the top back down with a serving spoon so no one knew any bites were missing. Food was everything to me. It was my harbor in the storm. It was my comfort. It was my friend. It numbed me. It made me feel calm. It kept the demons in my life behind closed doors. Food was much more important to me than anything else that I could have imagined. Now my grandmother made my dresses and they were always polyester and she made them on her kitchen table and she didn't pin them down to a pattern. She just laid table knives there and cut it out because as my waist grew thicker, the dresses that she made me looked like square boxes with armholes. <laughs> I never wore a two piece bathing suit. I never walked into a store when I was in junior high and bought a ready-made pantsuit that didn't look like a middle-aged woman. I never was picked for a team at recess, but that's okay, don't worry, because I do not like to sweat. <laughs> but I will tell you, even though I did not believe what Mr. Rogers said that I was special, I really believed that all kids were special. So I became a teacher, and for the next 25 years, I loved little learners. I wiped their noses, I put gold stars on their papers, I greeted them when they walked in my classroom every morning. I comforted them. I comforted Jacob, whose dad was in prison, and had sent him a peach pit Christmas ornament that he had carved. I wiped away Krista's tears when she told me that her mama had sold all of the clothes I bought her at a garage sale. Krista, who on Bring Your Pet to School Day brought her pet in a Quaker oatmeal container on the school bus. I was summoned to the cafeteria and there stood Krista, dirty clothes, unbrushed hair, holding her Quaker oatmeal container with a smile from ear to ear. Krista, 
Do you have a pet in that container? Yes. Is it a snake? No. Is it a kitten? No. Is it a frog? No. And then she opened the container and out flew the biggest black rooster that I had ever seen. <laughs> I said, Krista, did you bring that on the bus? Yes. I said, how did you get the rooster in that container? And she demonstrated. You just put his head in and then you take your foot and you push. And that is exactly what I did at the end of the day when it was time to put Krista and the rooster back on the bus and send them home to public housing where Krista lived. I comforted Lance, who only wanted on his third grade Christmas wish list a tombstone for his mama's grave. I loved them all. And when they came in my classroom, I told them that they were the most special, unique creatures ever made. And then I backed up those words with actions. I looked them in the eye and said good morning to them. I helped them pursue their dreams or discover what their dreams were. And as I stood, I tried to pretend like their little face was the only face that I saw in a sea of 26 little bodies. I hugged them all. I hugged the skinny ones. I hugged the angry ones. I hugged the broken ones, and I hugged the chubby ones, and I hugged the chubby ones a little bit tighter <laughs> because I wanted them to know that their worth as a person is never defined by a number on a scale or what your street address is or the kind of tennis shoes that you wear in gym class or if you live in a house with a mom and dad or two mamas and two daddies or grandparents or foster grandparents, or if you sleep in your car or you live in a pay-by-the-week motel room, that their worth as a person is defined because they are them and that there will never be another person in the entire world exactly like them. They are unique. They are special. They were my favorite. And all of a sudden, my heart started to realize and believe Mr. Rogers' words. As I taught those kids that they were special, my heart started to believe that maybe I was special too.